Many of us here are familiar with Malo LaJoya, elected Afghan Member of Parliament. Beginning in May 2007, she was barred from Parliament for three years for denouncing the many foreign-backed warlords and drug barons who dominate her government. At the same time, her diplomatic passport was taken away and she was also banned from appearing in the media within Afghanistan. In a letter she recently wrote to the Ottawa City Council expressing her clear opposition to the use of Ottawa facilities for any military trade shows, she says, and I quote, In the past eight years, under the so-called War on Terror imposed by the U.S. and allies against Afghan people, thousands of innocent people have fallen victim to the dreaded war machine of occupation forces. But still the terrorists are getting stronger day by day and Afghanistan is being changed into a world capital of the drug mafia. The coalition forces are not only killing our people with weapons, some of which are produced in Canada, but they are giving arms and support to warlords who are now policy makers in the puppet government of Hamid Karzai. They misuse their power to suppress Afghan people, especially women. And she continues, you may have heard of the USA bombardments of civilians in Afghanistan and the tragedies caused by it. The most recent example is a massacre in Balu Baluk district in western Afghanistan where US B-1 bombers dropped a series of 2,000 pound bombs on two small villages and over 143 civilians, mostly women and children, were were torn into pieces. Many mournful families never found their dead bodies of their loved ones as they were burnt in the flames of the bombs. In a similar incident, a wedding party was targeted in Nangar Hall, province of Afghanistan, and 47 women and children, including the bride, were killed. Such tragedies are daily realities for life of Afghan people. It's the end of the quote. It's worth mentioning that these attacks were carried out by warplanes thoroughly embedded with numerous essential Canadian components manufactured by Canadian companies. Canada's occupation of Afghanistan is only making the situation for women there more horrific, more dangerous, more undemocratic and oppressive. Even if we ignore the many reports on the fate of government aid reaching Afghanistan, which show that no more than 5% of it reaches any village, we know that all of the aid that Canada claims to deliver will never make a difference as long as we continue to support the bombing and brutal occupation of Afghanistan. I want to offer a simple fact and come back to it over and over again during this talk to remind us why we're all here, why we all care. I think we can all agree that when a child dies, it is a tragedy, right? A tragedy, no matter under what circumstances, no matter how or when or where. The death of a child is a horror, especially for its parents, but also the surrounding community and for all of us. And if we have the power to stop more deaths of children, we must do something about it. Can we all agree on that? Do we agree that that's true? If we all have the power to stop the deaths of more children, we must use that power. We are killing the children of Afghanistan, plain and simple. We are maiming them. We are hurting them by killing and maiming their parents their relatives, their siblings. You and I have the blood of Afghan children on our hands, and I don't say that lightly. Children who could have had a future but for our government's actions and snuffing out that future or distorting it beyond imagination. It's really as simple as that. And the perversity of our government's propaganda, right, is that we are expected to support the war in Afghanistan in order to save these children and women. 
What has our so-called help achieved in nearly eight years? And how are we exactly uh, responsible for the blood of Afghan children? How have we made the lives of children worse? The bombing raids and detentions, if they don't actually kill the people involved, have caused massive displacement. We're talking about thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, uh, and really, uh, if you count Pakistan as well, millions people displaced, both internally and externally. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees just released their latest statistic, and they found that one in four refugees across the world today is Afghan. One in four refugees across the world today is Afghan. Every family displaced, either inside Afghanistan or in Pakistan, has lost their home, has lost their day-to-day -day security and safety, their jobs. They have no idea how to feed their children. They have to scrounge up bread from the garbage, put their children to work, sometimes sell their children. And children die from easily treated diseases, starvation, and just pure elements. Have the governments of, Afghan, of NATO uh, made adequate arrangements for these refugees that are being created as a result of our bombs? Have they made adequate arrangements to feed, clothe, to shelter these refugees, that every family displaced will actually be taken care of? Or is that just collateral damage along with those directly killed? Uh, no, of course not. We just drop the bombs, we raid the villages, we walk away occasionally. We might build a well uh, or give some token food packages to pat ourselves on the back and convince ourselves that we're really there to help Afghan people and Afghan children. I think they can do without that kind of help. Bush, of course, uh, in his magnanimity, installed a puppet president in Afghanistan who was to bring democracy to the Afghan people so that the Afghan people themselves would save themselves, would liberate themselves. Of course, Hamid Karzai is very much seen as a puppet president by most Afghans, and his actions right from the very start, right from when he was elected, showed that he did not have the interests of the Afghan people at heart. He installed the most notorious warlords in Afghanistan, who have a history of killing Afghan children, raping Afghan women, and are now in power because we, collectively, we made it happen. So let's look at who these men are. We must look at their faces. We must know who they are. These are the men, not the one in the middle, but the one surrounding him, who are sitting in parliament today. In the middle is a warlord by the name of Faryadi Zardad. Uh, surrounding him are very notorious warlords, Abdul Rashid Dostam, Yunus Kanuni, Ismail Khan. What's the difference between the men in the ring and the men, man in the center? Not much in terms of their crimes. Zardad was famous for mass rapes, tortures, and murders in the uh, 80s and 90s. He looted and robbed innocent people, including uh, killing children in the early to mid-90s, in particular when Afghanistan was being overrun by, by these men in the wake of the Soviet troop withdrawal. And his colleague and enemy, Abdul Rashid Dostam, was equally notorious for murder, rape, and mayhem. The only difference between the man in the center and the man surrounding them is that Zardad is in a British prison for crimes committed while Abdul Rashid Dostam is a member of the Afghan government. Zardad made the mistake of escaping to Britain during the Taliban takeover of the, takeover of the country in the 1990s. He was tried and convicted of war crimes. And Abdul Rashid Dostam remained in the region and was employed by the US government to defeat the Taliban in 2001 after 9-11. During those early months of 2002, his men captured hundreds of Taliban soldiers and fighters who had surrendered, shut them inside a metal container, shot into the container, dumped the bodies into mass graves. In an incident that was covered widely by Time magazine and a documentary called Afghan Massacre Convoy of Death.